Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Nonprofit Success Lab. My name is Bethany Schultz, and I have the pleasure of serving on the board of Idaho Partners for Good. And Idaho Partners for Good is a nonprofit that supports other nonprofits, and we do that through leadership and business capacity development. So this is one offering um, that we provide to our local nonprofits, and it's a way to bring in experts, um, such as our speaker this morning, uh, to help with development of nonprofit boards and their leadership. So we thank you for investing the next hour into your professional development here. Um, during this hour, we really want you to engage and be present. We know you have a long list of things to do um, and often professional development gets put at the lower priority just because of the tyranny of the urgent. Uh, so we invite you this morning to turn on your camera, engage with questions in the chat or throughout the presentation as Connie has um, those interactive moments and invest in your professional development for the next hour. A little bit more about Idaho Partners for Good. Our vision is to develop stronger, healthier, and better equipped nonprofits so that you can do more of what you do best. Um, and so I said, as we do this in a number of ways, and we will talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, but I want to get into our session this morning. So we are in the middle of a series on uh, building trust and accountability among boards and nonprofit leaders. And so Connie has been our series speaker. This is her second session. And today we're gonna to be talking about uh, making board meetings that nobody wants to miss, uh, which I, I'm sure we've all sat in meetings that we wish to miss. And so she's going to help us <laughs> do, <laughs> um, do better in that area. Connie has been the, or is the CEO of Credible Advantage, which is a leadership development consulting firm. She was previously served as the president and CEO of Icon Credit Union, and she has served on over 20 boards and committees, including the Federal Reserve Bank, Community Council, and the College of Western Idaho Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Connie this morning. Thank you. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. Um, this is such an important topic, and it is not a glamorous topic. It is uh, really looking at board agendas and structuring to make sure that that experience for our board uh, works nicely. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have I actually added up one day, I've sat in over 600 board meetings uh, in my career, both reporting to a board of directors uh, as an employee and a CEO and a CFO, uh, but also all the boards that I've served on. Uh, and I've also served four terms as board chair. So I also have that experience and, and it comes with such wonderful uh, things as guiding a board as a volunteer as well. Uh, and so one of the things that I really observed and learned over the years was uh, if you want engagement from your board members and you want them to come to your board meetings and be consistent with attendance, uh, it's important that that meeting fulfills some of their needs as well and be interesting to them. Uh, while most of the topics we talk about in a board meeting can either be mundane requirements in order to just make sure that we have good oversight, uh, but also, uh, it's um, there's some big decisions that get made in the board meetings, and then there's um, this lull time where nothing big is really going on. Uh, and so I think it's important uh, to really take a step back and say, how can I, as both the executive director and the board chair, help guide our board so that when they do come, they're fully engaged, they're excited to be there? Because we always have to remember that these board members typically have another full-time job that they're doing. They have a family. Many of them serve on other boards. And so they're very busy people and they guard their time. And so they really do want it to be fulfilling. Uh, so um, I'm hoping I can give you some tips today of what I've seen um, on the high functioning boards that I've served on and what I've seen to really build engagement. And one of the things that's really important is as we build engagement among the board members, we also increase retention of uh, great board members as well, which is always a, a nice uh, thing. So let's talk about the general purpose of even why we have these meetings. Uh, every organization is different. Some meet monthly, some meet every other month, some meet quarterly. Uh, but really the purpose of these meetings is to facilitate, to bring everyone together and facilitate this decision-making and oversight responsibilities. So it is bigger than just seeing reports and moving forward. It is really what is the responsibilities 
And if you look at organizations, uh, hopefully your organization, most boards have this, they have a directors and officers insurance. Uh, and it is very important that your board meetings reflect enough information to show that you are acting in good faith, serving on that board to protect that organization. And so these meetings are critical to document that and show that. So the facilitation and decision-making and oversight of all these responsibilities, uh, it should include uh, an opportunity to you for you to provide some type of strategic direction. In other words, here is the most important things we work on today. Here's why we exist. Definitely financial oversight. It is bigger than just getting financial reports. It's actually glancing at them, making sure that you understand the trends what is happening. Risk management, this is everything from compliance uh, needs, anything that we need to be talking about that could be risk management. Risk management also includes paying attention to things like, sometimes we forget about this, but it's our reputation in the community, reviews about our organization, but also how are we investing our funds? Is it giving us enough that we feel really good that we're gonna be in a safe place should we have a downturn year, uh, as an example. And then uh, certainly uh, compliance and governance, the boards are responsible to make sure that their boards are um, uh, operating under the correct legal uh, area, that they're following the law, uh, both state and federal that apply to their organizations. And then also uh, performance management. So in a board meeting, it provides board members to the the best opportunity to assess the competency and the leadership of the CEO or executive director and also their senior team as they start building relationships and understand what succession planning um, is like. And then the second piece of this is just providing this opportunity to ensure that your activities, everything you're working on is aligned with your organization's missions and goals. So that's really the purpose of the board meetings. So. Oftentimes we wonder who are the board meetings for? And, uh, and so I wanted to really throw this in here because uh, the board meetings are for, for all stakeholders. Uh, clearly they're required as your function, uh, a serious function of what the board is and why they exist. Uh, but they also are for the CEO and executive director because the uh, uh, executive director should be able to walk out of a meeting with more clarity about what they should be working on and where the organization is going. So they are equally important for the leader of that organization that's gonna carry out all of those functions. Uh, so they both need to be invested in making sure that they are getting what they need from this meeting. And um, good board assessments can scope this out. There's a wonderful board assessments available out there, such as boardsource.com has some wonderful ones. I've got a variety of ones, but uh, making sure that your board members are providing input and assessments on a regular basis, at least annually, to tell you how are they feeling? Are they getting what they need? Are we talking about the right things in board meetings? So this is a typical board agenda that I see. They're usually pretty basic. There's usually a call to order. Then we have last month's or last quarter's minutes that are reviewed and approved. Uh, by the way, number two is your one of your most important functions to go through. So often we just glance at minutes and we think, yeah, that's kind of what we talked about. But it is very important that if there's anything in there that's important to document your due diligence as a board member, you don't have to state all the due diligence, but it is important important that these are documented in your minutes that you completed things, such as the board researched several options for da 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 da, so that it shows that you completed um, some due diligence. It is your protection uh, to document what you have done as a board. And so sometimes we take reviewing the previous meetings minutes lightly, uh, but they are an important function because once they're approved, you are saying that is exactly what happened in that last meeting. And so it's important when you glance at those to say, I think it would also be really helpful to add this piece to the minutes just so it's well documented that we did that. And then of course, there's usually reports. Usually uh, the board chair uh, may have some reports. There's a whole lot of reports that are produced by the paid staff typically, including the CFO or the finance uh, person. And then there's a lot of financial reports. So 
That's usually what shows up in reports. Occasionally also what shows up in reports are depending how large your organization is, you can also have several reports that are committee, um, not, not committee, but department reports such as marketing department and maybe operations department. So if you have, for example, vice presidents, you're large enough to do this, many times you'll have like a program director report or some other reports. So that's um, also falls in number three. And then the, the fourth one is board committees. These are things like your audit committee, your finance committee, uh, fund development committee, and usually there's committee reports in there. Uh, it is important when you have board committees that the board committee chair be the one that presents on their committee uh, status. So an example is audit committee may not have a report. It's a, a once a year function. They may only have a report where they report out three months, which is who we're, we need to select as an auditor. Here's what the audit looked like. Here's our follow-up from that audit. Uh, so not all these committees will be reporting every board meeting. It's whatever you decide. Definitely finance committee should be reporting at every board meeting. And then uh, there's a lot of work in those board committees that goes on behind the scenes, and then it's brought to the board. So once again, it's very important in those committee meeting minutes that you are documenting all the great work that you're doing there as well. And then those are brought to um, the board. And then there's usually an old business and a new business, and we lump a whole lot of things in there. And I'm going to give you some recommendations of how to expand your board agenda to make sure that we're talking about the most important things and some tips to allow you the time to make sure that you're being very strategic. Uh, and then there is usually a formal adjournment. And it is important that you document the time when you start a meeting and the time when you end. That is due diligence. If a meeting only takes 15 minutes, there's no way you can actually look at this meeting and say we covered all the very important things if it's your regular routine meeting. So you do wanna document um, the adjournment. And the Roberts rules is important in all this uh, is to make sure that you're documenting that someone formally asked for you to adjourn. So that's what I typically see in a typical board agenda, but I'm gonna give you a lot of recommendations on how to expand your board agenda, tweak it to build engagement and uh, have it be fulfilling to your board members. So here's some recommendations that I have, and we're gonna go through some of these in a little more detail. This is what I recommend that you do, uh, and I've seen it all over the board. You can take pieces and parts of this, uh, but it definitely builds a stronger board when you're using this expanded agenda. And then we're gonna talk about how you find the time to do this, because that's always the biggest concern is we have busy, busy professionals that serve on our board. They only have one hour to meet. Uh, what are we going to do uh, to be able to add these additional things? So uh, definitely there's a call to order. So a mission moment is critical. The boards that I've seen for organizations that have really engaged board members have every board meeting start off once they call to order with a mission moment. These are usually five to 10 minutes in length, not long, but they might be a video clip from uh, someone, and I'm going to go into what good mission moments are going to, uh, can entail in, in a bit. Uh, some additions to agenda, a uh, board, uh, chair can ask for additions to agenda. We're going to talk about the board chair, um, talking about how to prioritize action items. And then, um, the things on the bottom there are red or additional things that are really, really good. Uh, strategic discussion we're going to talk about. We're also going to talk about adding an agenda item about risk management and compliance and just pausing and asking yourself some really important questions. And occasionally there's a report or two that could be put in there to protect the board and um, the team. Executive session, uh, that says if needed. Uh, boards handle this a variety of ways, and I'm going to share what I think is the best practice around these. And then we got some miscellaneous other things we're going to talk about. So these expanded red items are things that I'm going to recommend that you add uh, in some fashion or manner to your uh, typical board agenda. And I'll explain kind of why behind some of these. Uh, all of these slides are meant for you to be able to get a copy of them and just take them and use them. So you will be able to request a copy of all of these when we're done. All right, so let's talk about mission moment. If you are invested in the organization and the purpose of why they exist and who they serve, 
you are much more engaged as a board member and your contribution to that organization is usually significantly higher, including the ability to be the strongest advocate in the community and the strongest fundraising. But I see a lot of boards misstep here because they completely forget to bring to the table the thing that's going to create the passion around the room. And they see the board more as a business, just deal with business uh, type of function. When in fact, if you want engaged board members that are really looking for opportunity and building awareness about your organization and certainly fundraising, you need to have a mission moment in every board meeting. So these are ideas you can bring in a recipient to share a story that's received services from you. The staff are usually the ones that look for these opportunities because they're out and about and they hear the stories. And so sometimes uh, this, this actually takes an intentional focus to find these. And we do it all day long. Every nonprofit does amazing work. We just forgot, forget to think about how do we make sure our board members are invested in this and hearing it actually bringing in a person that's received your services and sharing their personal story where they can meet that person is really important. We tend to not like to do that because we bring them all the way to our meeting for only a five to 10 minute presentation, but it is critically important and it sets a nice tone to your meeting. Uh, the staff can share a customer service story, for example. They can share also your internal team impact story Something that's happened with your own team members can be a great mission moment, such as here is this benefit we give employees. Here's how they're using it. Here's what has happened to this one team member as a result of it. Those make great mission moments as well. Uh, share community engagement story. Uh, if you've been out in the community and you're able to connect with others, some story around that. If you, if, even a few photos about your day out in the community at that event where the board members can touch and feel what you're accomplishing. That's super important. And then also sometimes a great mission moment is just data that you're either that you ran across or something confirming either the need you're serving as your organization, but also the involvement in your organization as well. So video clips are wonderful here about, for example, if you have a, a larger organization like Girl Scouts, for example, has GSUSA. And GSUSA has wonderful video clips of miscellaneous things that are going on all the time. But I really encourage you the most you can keep this local. It is just it just touches uh, what they're doing. And there's nothing that will just make you say, this is why I'm sitting here in this meeting, giving up my precious time. So mission moments are critical. I'm uh, on uh, currently on a finance committee, for example, for St. Alphonsus, and they do a fabulous job of having a patient story. And they also have a mission moment uh, uh, in at the beginning of every meeting. And it just, it just sets such an amazing tone for the meeting, especially finance committee, where sometimes um, you don't get the glamorous topics there. The next addition that I'm gonna recommend is that you actually have uh, the board uh, chair should, and this is um, kind of a Robert's rules, but I don't see many board members doing this. And that's that you ask, is there any additions to the agenda that we would like to add today? So before you get heavy into your meeting, let's ask for additional agenda items in advance. So what I really have seen as a great best practice is about a week before the meeting or before you send the agenda out. So maybe it's a day before you're finalizing your agenda. Hey, uh, you know, we'll be sending the uh, board packet out tomorrow. If anyone has additional agenda items that are important, we make sure and put on our agenda this meeting, please let us know. Uh, if you do this, your meetings flow better and you don't get off topic, you don't chase as many squirrels during your meeting. It also gives the board chair a beautiful opportunity to organize the, the meeting. And so they have a feel, they can adjust the time they're gonna spend on things and it just gives them that opportunity. So. Uh, determine future agenda items that need more discussion and research. Sometimes someone will ask for something to be put on the agenda that is an additional item, such as maybe a new opportunity of a piece of property that just came available that you might be interested in. That's a big discussion. So it is important to get it on the agenda, but never feel like you have to solve everything that landed on your agenda that day. In other words, I kind of call it like the parking lot or the future agenda. 
So at least get it on there and then share what will happen with that agenda item. So you plant the seed, you share a summary of what you want to add, and then you talk about, okay, what are we going to do with this? Are we going to fully process it today? Or is this something we'll make sure and bring back next board meeting? So that's um, a good addition to agenda uh, best practice. And then an additional item is um, the board asking uh, and being clear what action items will take place in that board meeting. So uh, we often uh, sometimes will throw these under old business if it was something we talked about before or new business. And that is okay. Uh, to do, but when you can set the tone of here's the most important things we want to make sure we take action on today, and you actually have that be part of your agenda, then the entire room knows these are the most important things we want to accomplish before we get out of here. Sometimes what happens is we spend so much time on reports and miscellaneous questions around them that we get to the end of the meeting, we only have five minutes left, and we have these really important things to process. And so when you do this, it actually gets everyone in the room in the right frame of mind of just managing your board meeting time and making sure that you get to these important topics. So it's actually nice to actually even have it as an agenda item. And then there's a um, this whole strategic discussion. So they say, are you talking about the most important things in your board meetings? And so often we get this routine down of where we just go through, let's review all the reports and, and we do some of those things. But there should be some really good questions thrown out and you don't have to ask all these in every board meeting, but you should be throwing out a couple questions. And my recommendation is go back and look at your strategic plan. If you have done a strategic planning session, if you haven't, then there are some wonderful things that are out there online. You can just Google how to have uh, how to make better decisions, how to have a good strategic discussion. I've got a wide variety of questions I can send you if you reach out that are wonderful questions. And I usually took two or three every single board meeting and we would ask different questions to get the thinking going, such as let's talk about what's our greatest opportunity today that we might be missing. And uh, and these are wonderful because um, these are discussions you don't want to miss as a board member. And so when you know you're going to be talking about some of these bigger things, such as are we meeting the needs of what our mission says or how do we build a sustainable Hi. family? Good. Are, I've got someone that needs to be. OK, thank you. I was going to say I'm getting a lot of background um, noise. OK, so that's the strategic discussion uh, piece of it. So. Having that actually be part of it, the agenda is very important to make sure that you don't gloss over that and that the only time we talk about these things is at strategic planning session time once a year. They do need to be talked about. Things come up all year long and we just should be, these are good check-in as well. They're kind of a gut check for us. And then um, risk management and compliance. Sometimes these are included in miscellaneous reports. So for example, when I was CEO of the credit union, we had reports around delinquencies and charge offs. And we had an internal auditor um, report that would show findings on audits. Those are kind of risk management. And they were just part of our standard reports, which is just fine. But there's also this beautiful discussion that can happen that's very beneficial, which is uh, this discussion around what's our greatest risk? What could hurt the organization? What is the biggest challenge? Succession planning actually falls into this one. Are we prepared in the event that uh, our CEO is unable to come to work? What happens if a key executive uh, turns in their notice today? Things like that. And then part of risk management and compliance is also if something happens. So if you are in, for example, a healthcare business, and if something happens and it hits the media, what is your plan for that? How do you address and handle if you get some bad PR? Uh, some of that falls under this risk management and compliance as well. So you are welcome to dump this section up under reports if you like, but having it as a separate agenda item, I've seen boards be very successful of just making sure this is a great reminder to all your board that this is important for us. It is one of our roles as a board member that we need to be talking about. And then let's talk about executive session. So executive session, uh, for any of you that aren't aware, it is an opportunity for the board to get together and talk 
independently. This can include the CEO or not. Uh, sometimes it's just an opportunity to remo remove all the other staff so that you can have this dis um, confidential discussion. Uh, but executive session, uh, what my what I have seen that works incredibly well is to have it be part of every agenda. And at the end of the meeting, uh, sometimes I like to have it be the last thing. So you'll do your other business and guest presentations. Then you move exec session right before adjournment. That actually works pretty well. Some people like it uh, before. But executive session is wonderful if you have it as a routine because here's what happens. I've been on both the board chair role and the CEO role. When you have a random executive session, it causes a lot of anxiety. And it's like, what is? what are they talking about? What is the problem? So my recommendation is it just be routine. You go into executive session as a routine. If there's any, any challenges, then you can process them there. Uh, and, and executive session, I had a large team, for example, in a few boards that I served on and uh, in, in my uh, professional career, where we wanted to have all the executives leave so that we could talk about that gave me my opportunity to talk about succession planning challenges that I might have had with the team, confidential things that might be coming up where I maybe didn't want them in that conversation. So it just reduces anxiety and uncertainty. And I think it actually builds a little bit of trust and confidence if you can just have routine exec sessions, even if there's nothing to talk about. The important part about exec sessions is to remind yourself you can never take action in executive session. So you can have all the confidential conversation in the world. And the beautiful thing about exec session is that confidential conversation doesn't land in board minutes, but you can't take action. So if you actually have a motion as a result of your conversation, you need to come out of executive session and then have that be part of your regular board meeting and then come then um, finish either finish your board meeting or whatever. So because of how this all works, my recommendation is put your exec session at the very end of your agenda and do everything else. And then it's just part of your normal uh, routine. You excuse the staff or whatever, and then you have your session. Uh, and so put it actually on your agenda. And then we're going to talk about other businesses. Just typically we'll see that's just the miscellaneous new things sometimes um if when the board chair asks for hey is there any additional uh additions to the agenda this is where that can fall under if it doesn't quite fit in one of the other um, categories uh, and then guest presentations and board education which we'll talk about those so uh as a reminder with exec session they're only required if you need them so you aren't required to have them every meeting i just recommend that you do and then um, as a reminder, you can't take action in exec session. You have to come out, take your motion, and then um, uh, you can go back into exec session if you want. And so in um, one of the biggest challenges with uh, adding these additional items is always time. Like right now, we barely get through our agenda in our one hour. So it is a really good discussion for you to ask are you allowing sufficient time to do the work of the board that your organization needs in your meetings? In other words, you should never be held hostage to what you decided your meeting length should be. If you are consistently finding that you are rushing through the most important things you should be talking about, you need to have a bigger strategic discussion, which is, should our meetings be an hour and a half or should they be two hours or should we meet more often? Whatever uh, that discussion is, it should never be, uh, you should never be held hostage to the fact that, well, we have people that can't give us more than one hour. If in fact you do need more than one hour to accomplish. And I have seen boards where they extend their meetings when they have maybe some big things going on, such as possibly a merger with another large nonprofit uh, some big, maybe some big uh, projects that are going on. Uh, maybe it's an extreme heavy focus on fundraising and they need more time to process and, and build uh, that plan. Uh, then they may agree to increase board meeting time for the next year and then kind of go back. So it is just very, very important. And the other thing that I consistently see 
is we try to cram planning sessions in a very, very short period of time. Uh, and uh, typically I get the calls from the CEOs or board chairs saying, hey, can you help us with the planning session? And I'll say, how much time uh, do you have? Has that been set? Yes, we only have two hours. Okay, so that means we need to do a lot of pre-work, right? So that we're showing up in that two hours the most effective we can be. But I also always caution that is that really gonna allow you to brainstorm and have adequate discussion that is needed? So it is really, really important in this to really have this broader discussion. If your clock is your biggest handicap, you need to really have a bigger discussion about do we need to increase our meetings? So let's talk about how to use a consent agenda to make your meetings more effective. Uh, there is many boards that still are not using consent agendas and it is a wonderful tool for you. So the three items there under consent agenda, which is approval of previous meetings, uh, re all your reports, financials, everything, and then all your board committee reports, if they're done in writing, can all be included in what's called the consent agenda. And it is one motion that approves everything. So how this works is the board chair will ask, is there anything in the consent agenda, which are all these reports, that we would like to pull off and have a discussion of outside of the approval of the rest of the consent agenda. And that's how this works. So it allows you in five minutes to approve all of these reports as a consent agenda. And you may have a board member that wants to pull one or two out for further discussion, such as I'd like to talk about page three, the income statement and the financials. And so the board chair will take that item, pull it out as a separate agenda item, and then approve the rest of the consent uh, items that were presented as they were presented. And so you have one motion. So what this requires is the commitment from the board to make sure that you are actually reviewing all these reports. Because so often the board members might show up at the meeting and they start going through everything right then. And then they're not, then they may be passing the motion to approve them when they haven't fully reviewed them. So I have seen board chairs be really great at, at uh, asking, hey, did everyone notice this particular thing? Did everyone read you know, this? And they try to remind the board members of their obligation on a, making sure they reviewed anything in the consent agenda. Because if you are making a motion and agreeing to that motion that you have reviewed them and you approve all those reports, you are actually doing that. And so you are responsible for it. So that's how consent agendas work. When you look at the amount of time that you spend in your board meetings, some boards still spend 45, I would say maybe 45 minutes out of every hour on all of these reports. When in fact, you can accomplish this in five minutes and then move to all these other really important discussions. So use your consent agenda if you aren't today to free up time for the really important discussions. The important part is you always allow the opportunity to take anything out of that batch of reports and discuss separately if you want. And then if you do do that, that is the very next item in your agenda that you're going to be processing together. Okay, um, so that's how. Uh -huh. We had a question. Sure. Um, when you can you cover a little bit about moving items from new business to old business and then when things can be removed? Sure. So in general, when an item hasn't been discussed yet, it's the first time it's come to the board, then it goes under new business. After it has been in one board packet and you've discussed it, it always becomes old business. Okay, so even if you have new action to take on it, it still falls under old business. So that's the important part is, has this ever been a brand new topic that we've talked about? And um, if it hasn't, then put that under new business. Good question. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you for keeping track of those questions for me. Okay, <clears throat> the most important thing is your board meetings are interesting. And investing in board education and board training and business training is very, very important. So 
uh, I have seen uh, boards be incredibly successful and have the shared fate of in investment in the success of the organization when you add 10 minutes of board training to every single board meeting. And they need to be interesting enough that you don't want to miss them and or critically important that you don't want to take a whole board meeting and go through all your bylaws as an example. So some education ideas are some board governance sec segments. So this would be like reviewing um, a two or three things out of Robert's rules, uh, taking two or three. What do we do when a person wants to amend a motion? Here's how we do that. It can be something like that. Bylaw segments. I'm a big believer to go through your all your bylaws a little bit each meeting so that, it, that you have this constant reminder of what they are. So then once a year when you need to change them, you've all seen them at least once a year, uh, especially for board members that have served a long time. It's easy to forget what's in your bylaws. Uh, and for brand new board members, it's a good reminder what's in your bylaws. So five minutes maybe or 10 minutes around your bylaws is important. And then board policy review. So um, effective boards make sure that they go through all their board policies once a year. So they usually will pull one or two board policies and they'll put them in the packet in advance and the staff will review them. And rarely have I seen a board policy that doesn't have some updates in it. So it's also a good opportunity to update your board policy throughout the year. So depending on how many you had, for example, at the credit union, I think we had 30 board policies. So we did about two a month that we just put in the packet and it forced the staff also to read thoroughly through them and say, does this still apply? Do I have recommendations for the board in this policy? And so some of these things you can actually put in that other business category. That's where we put them. So rather than under the board education section, we actually had some standard agenda items that were in our other business. And that's where we put these things. Um, examiners and auditors love seeing you do this. Uh, it just shows a wonderful board governance uh, best practice. But let's talk about professional development and training you can bring to your board. So what we have to remember, are these all professionals, they come from all walks of life. Many of them love, they're in leadership, they love to perfect their own professional development and personal development. And when you can have this wonderful add-on for them as part of your board meetings, it increases board engagement and it makes them not want to miss it. So um, again, you wanna limit this to 10 minutes unless it's an important topic they wanna spend more time on. And then sometimes we've said, okay, we're gonna spend 20 or 30 minutes because we're gonna bring in a guest speaker and we're gonna do work. So for example, uh, strengths finders. Uh, we had all of our board take the assessment and then we brought in a guest speaker that showed the entire board and where we might use that to put certain people into the fundraising segment. Certain people are better on finance committee and things like that. So you can always extend this if you want. But if you invest at least 10 minutes every board meeting to have a short, it, it could be just a short clip, a short video. It can be a guest speaker that's going through just really quick segment. Uh, many of your organizations you're affiliated with have some wonderful, maybe some risk management pieces. Uh, crucial conversations is a wonderful topic. So these are just topics I've seen that uh, DEI, for example, is a great one where when boards bring in some of these things, it is important. Finance 101 is always appreciated. In other words, here's our financials. Here's the three ratios that are the most important we talk about. Let's just do a refresher on what goes into these ratios. Uh, those are some wonderful ideas around board education. And, uh, and I have seen if you can invest in this piece of it and make it fun and interesting, board members really look forward to it. Because you have to remember they're giving of their precious time. Your goal is to have your board members leave your board meetings very glad that they came and with some takeaways. And this is your opportunity to invest in them as leaders and professionals as part of their board service, which is really important to do. So I'm a, uh, I am a huge believer of making sure that you add this to your board meetings. It just, uh, board, I've always received wonderful positive things about 
bringing in miscellaneous things. So examples of these things are look at what you're working on as an organization. I remember at the credit union, for example, we were expanding into Canyon County uh, branches. And so we brought in uh, a wonderful local speaker that really understand, understood and shared some things about the Hispanic culture and things that we should be aware of and how they do their finances. And it was a fascinating uh, period of just 10 to 15 minutes uh, that we had. They really, really appreciated it. And I would hear them in future discussions go back and talk about something that they heard in that presentation. So um, I really encourage you to invest in this. Um, your HR departments, for those of you that are big enough to have an HR department, are wonderful resources for this. Uh, and also uh, other organizations like Idaho Nonprofit Center, Idaho Partners for Good would be fabulous. Any consultant that's working with boards would be fabulous to give you little short segments and, and most of them would be very happy to come and do uh, a short segment on some of these. So uh, I, I actually brought in uh, crucial conversations to my board. I have a presentation on keeping drama out of the boardroom, uh, how to get all board members engaged, all those things. So. I think that that is super important. Uh, one of the complaints I consistently hear from CEOs is my board isn't engaged. Uh, it's hard to get them to do more. Um, there's always these things. And so um, it is important that your board chair own the engagement piece of it as much as the CEOs, uh, but your board should all be engaged and they should be strong contributors. Uh, it's just the fairness thing to the organization. So here's some ideas for you. One uh, really good idea, I've seen this work very well, is when your board chair asks for thoughts from every board member on important, these are especially your biggest things. Because if you have 15 board members and you go around the room and they each take five minutes, you just spend a whole lot of time on important topics. So, um, you know, just mentioning, I'd like some just some brief initial thoughts usually 15 seconds to 30 seconds is the max that they need. And then board chair has to be really good to be able to steer that um, conversation so it doesn't go on too long. But ask for each board member's thoughts. Uh, when, when they know you're gonna go around the room and they're gonna have to share what they're thinking, they naturally are more engaged and they know you care about why they're sitting in that seat. If you have a board that is comprised of your couple uh, more vocal board members, more dominant vocal, uh, dominant and or vocal board members that are just comfortable sharing their ideas more than an average board member. And that is where all your comments are coming from. All your other board members will be less engaged, plus they don't feel comfortable sharing. And so when a board chair actually asks for this, then they know that their role is important. The other thing is if you have a big board, the board chair can just randomly call on a few board members for their thoughts. Um, and these are these are almost always these topics that are in your new business, certainly uh, big topics where you're um, gonna have a motion passed about something such as a name change. Uh, we had some of these big things at the credit union, for example, and my board chair was masterful at going around and getting input from every board member. And those that were, average in importance, uh, she might randomly call on two or three and call on the quiet ones and just ask them for their thoughts. So they always were more engaged once they knew that that was a possibility. Good quality board orientation is one of the best things you can do to get engagement. Because if you think about it, if you're recruited to a board, you show up, you know these people have all been serving and they know a whole lot more than you do about this board. So good board orientation does two things. It sets the tone nicely for what you're all about and it gets them some orientation and you set the tone in that uh, board orientation about what you're all about, what is going on, but also that we, here's all the reports, here's what you should be looking at in each of these reports. So I would always go through a full board packet and say, this is probably the most important two things on this page. Uh, and then here's the history of why this is in the board packet. So they come prepared. You're, you should never have a board member show up at a, your first board, their first board meeting and not have gone through board orientation. And then a buddy system works beautiful on boards. Every new board member should have an existing board member that they can just 
ask random questions that they don't feel comfortable asking in front of the large group. That one will help as well. And then um, have activities between board meetings to build relationships. And this builds the shared faith. So if you think about it, you're all there to serve this very important function. But if you don't have the trust and the camaraderie with each other, you're not going to feel as comfortable leaning into that board as you would if you knew each other on a personal level. So this is critically important for boards that only meet quarterly. You cannot understand each other and build a relationship when you only show up quarterly to a board meeting. It is very difficult. So having opportunities where maybe you all meet uh, for um, a lunch somewhere or at a board member's house just for a cocktail hour, or I've even seen boards be successful where they'll pull together a board activity where the boards will go and do top golf together or just it's critically important that your board members know each other, that they build some type of relationship so that they build this desire to have a shared fate and all work together through difficult times. Because you will have difficult times that you have to work through on your board. And you'll want each other to have enough of a relationship that it increases the respect and the camaraderie that happens with your board. So this is critically important if you don't meet very often. Uh, but I'm a big believer, and it is not a requirement that they participate, but board members love to get to know more about other board members. And here's the thing I'm going to say about the average board member, and this is what I learned. I wrote a whole chapter about this in my book because I really saw the, the wowness around it. And that is people that say yes to serving on boards are amazing humans generally. And they are people that are fascinating and they have a lot to bring to the table. And so to get them to build the camaraderie with each other is a win-win for everybody. They love to hear and respect and, and just build this relationship with these other amazing humans. So I'm a big believer of having some board activities where you can do this. Uh, we had dinner and uh, some of our boards would have dinner in the middle of the board meeting like break, let's have dinner, let's have, and there was some wonderful discussion and we encouraged them all try not to talk about board work during dinner. Let's talk about other fun things going on. It was a wonderful opportunity to have good discussions there as well. So that's just an option. And then board members to build engagement. Oftentimes the CEO or the executive director is doing all the talking. They're presenting the reports there. And the more you can get where your board members are delivering the committee reports and all of that, the better. So the committee chairs um, can actually even ask their committee members to participate in presentations, but it will increase discussion and engagement of board members if you can get board members to be delivering the committee reports and actually uh, managing the board agenda and leading the board through the board agenda. When we turn it over to exec teams, it gets a little bit more stronger on the bias side of what the staff feels should be done. And the board are typically less engaged and less comfortable sharing their ideas. So that is just a, a best practice that, uh, that I think is really, really important. So that's how you build um, kind of an engagement uh, piece to it, which uh, is, uh, I've just seen it work incredibly well where board members um, just have lifetime friends uh, and they committed to each other. The other thing that happens if you can build this and be successful at it, which is pretty cool, is once a board member is unable to continue to serve, either because your board term uh, you know, doesn't allow them to serve an additional term or they're moving on because their, you know, uh, world is, um, you know, changing and they can't serve, they can't uh, meet the needs that the board is going to need. Uh, they will continue to support your existing board members from afar much greater when you have this engagement piece as part of your board. In other words, they still are committed to each other's success even though they aren't serving on the board anymore. They will go bye-bye and you will never hear from them if you don't have engagement on your board. In other words, they came just to sit through the meetings. They don't know you. They don't have 
They feel like they don't have accountability to you and they will move on. So you will actually lose a lot of opportunity there if you don't have um, the engagement piece as well. So this is another just best practice in addition to the mission moments that will build that nicely. Okay. So uh, this is one of my favorite slides of all times. Uh, and the reason why this is absolutely my favorite is every single person sitting in that boardroom, every single staff sitting in that boardroom has ideas of how to do things better, has ideas of what changes the organization needs. Uh, and what is so important that you create this culture of making sure that they're all there to be part of the change, part of the challenges, part of the success of what you just accomplished. So often we have some pretty big things that the board works on that are either big transition in the organization, big projects, you know, maybe opening a brand new large center and we get through the center and we forget to include them in all the celebration pieces also after that. Uh, but also, we need to make sure that people stay in the game through the difficult times. So bringing in training like crucial conversations and having this shared fate where we all have each other's back as a board will increase the opportunity that they will stay in the game with you. If you don't have that, it is easy for them just to resign and move on and you lose all of the investment that you had in recruiting that board member. So. It is just something that is important that each of us have to remember that we have to keep growing also as professionals uh, because we need to keep changing and growing as well. And we can't just expect everyone else to. So this cartoon I just love because it has a lot of meanings around it. But in the end, it's we're, you're going to receive all kinds of ideas and all kinds of opportunities. And it is important that with each one of those, you stay in the game of how to make those work or how to process them correctly. And you have to have input into each of those. You can't be the silent person as a board member that's sitting there. And as staff, uh, one of the challenges I get is, Connie, what do I do with this? Like, I'm seeing this as the executive director, but I don't have, for example, a board chair that I don't know how to guide my board chair through this. Uh, and the best thing I can say is these are just really good, healthy conversations about what is in the best interest of the organization. And you can take this presentation, for example, you can take 10 minute clip out of it and you can be part of your board meeting. So we just find a way that you're bringing things to your board meeting all the time to make sure that the two of you are really working together. It's both of you that can help build this, but it cannot be one or the other with board engagement. It has to be uh, a team thing which is um, critically important. So I really wanna open up for questions because this is what I know. There is no two boards that are the same. There's no two organizations that are the same. And there's no two board and CEO relationships that are the same. So um, there's no two board agendas um, that are exactly the same. So I would love to open up, uh, just take yourself off mute and let's open up some questions that maybe I can um, help guide. Maybe there's a practical question like, okay, yeah, I recognize we don't do this. What are some practical tips that you might have? Uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, so my name's Lane Burgess. I'm the executive director for the Southeast Idaho Council of Governments. Okay. Um, and the way that our bylaws are set up, it allows a voting member from every municipality, county, um, a water district, and then we have four special interest groups. So in total, we have 42 voting board members. And I, I really struggle with the fact that because a lot of more elected officials, I get a lot of turnaround every election cycle. And, uh -huh. and so it's just, I feel... I feel like I can't keep people engaged and the board yes. engaged. I can get the executive council engaged, but the main body, it's hard to even get them to show up. Yes. I work with um, several organizations that have that situation of elected officials that are trustees or, you know, whatever. And um, it's not, it, it's much more difficult in those regards, right? Because 
you may not have placed them on your board or, you know, so do you have an executive committee or a smaller group? We do. Okay. So I would start there and I would invest heavy in that. And that group, I would challenge them. So I would use some of these best practices in that smaller group. And uh, whether that's your side meetings, whatever it is. And then I would challenge that group to ask yourself, what can we send out to the other 40 to keep them engaged beyond the board packet? So is there something we could send midweek? Is there a weekly email we can send that includes three amazing things that we accomplished this week or a, a mission moment story so that they are connected with you in what you are accomplishing? So these are success stories. Uh, and always remember that it's okay to share a challenge on occasion. It actually builds trust and uh, there's this humble humility piece of it that builds trust when you are actually willing to also share a challenge. It has to be an appropriate challenge you're sharing. You don't want to just open up a, a bucket of worms, but um, that's what my recommendation is. And then if there is a way that you can segment some of these and have them, uh, I call them build quads, uh, where you have maybe four or five working together and, you know, at times where they you'll have to get creative and challenge your exec committee, but what could that look like? Can we at least put people in smaller pods where they're maybe they're connecting on occasion uh, for a particular common goal? That's another idea that you can do, but yeah, it is a challenge uh, and they, and they can show up as much as they want, right? Uh, that's the other challenge. So you can't force them. Uh, what you can do is give them all the tools, but really go to work on most, most organizations such as that, have this beautiful smaller committee that you can go to work on. Okay, thank you. Great Richard question. has his hand up. Did you have a question, Richard? Yeah, I just put it in the chat. Um, Connie, I really Hi, appreciated Richard. your presentation. Um, so much uh, applied to boards that I have worked with and, and currently our advisory committee. And the the question is, uh, an advisory committee is much like a board, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet, if if I don't have engagement with my advisory committee, it's very much catch and release, <laughs> as you yes. discussed. And so there's a lot of effort that goes into that. How engaged should you be with an advisory committee? Um, I don't think near as engaged as your board by any means, but definitely, uh, and they need more advisory committees need, need more TLC and more admission moments and engagement opportunities than your board uh, because they're serving. And also they're, they're a good source of succession planning, right? To join uh, onto your board. Um, so I've seen like the Y, for example, has some amazing advisory. They have pretty good success with their advisory committees that they create where they pull them in, engage them at the local level. Uh, so it might be a wonderful conversation for you to have with David Duro about how do you do this? Because I've seen them be incredibly successful with building local pockets of advisory committees. Um, and so I've actually built uh, advisory uh, boards on a few different boards that I've had uh, and served on where we didn't have one exist. Uh, and uh, in all of them that I've participated in with the exception of focus groups, which are kind of like an advisory um, committee, uh, they've been very small in numbers and they've actually attended board meetings and they're just non-voting. And that helps build the camaraderie if you can do that where you don't have room on your board to add another board member, but you also want, so for example, at the credit union, we looked around the room and said, our board is not representative of our target audience that we just defined. We don't have anyone here between 20 and 35. You know, we were all uh, much older. So we added two advisory board members that actually attended meetings uh, and then built them into succession planning to be a future board member. So you can do some things like that, but you should invest in them. But by far, I would start first with your core board. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, I definitely am here for a resource for you uh, if you think of other things and um, hopefully you'll be able to take just pieces and parts of this and, um, and improve your board experience. Thank you so much, Connie. 
Um, so just to quickly wrap us up here, um, as I mentioned at the at the beginning of the session, we have other services besides just our nonprofit success lab. We do encourage you to come um, put this on your calendar as a monthly event. In the chat, I just put a link to register for next month's session, um, which is also with Connie, and she is going to be talking about stomping out drama and life in the workplace. And there was a couple moments when Connie referenced, um, asked somebody to come in and do something. So another service we offer is consulting services. Even if you're not sure you can commit to a full consultant, um, you are welcome to reach out to us and we can connect you with resources or um, do some of those kind of uh, one-off things in your board meetings or with your, your leadership. Um, so please reach out to us if you need consulting services. We are available for both nonprofits and not nonprofits. Um, and a portion of our consulting fees then helps fund our pro bono work with Idaho's nonprofits. And um, so we hope that you can join us next month again with Connie and stomping out that drama in the workplace. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful month. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm excited next time is this is not just stomping out drama, but you're gonna get some really good tips of what do you do when you get that one uh, person that might throw out something or you get the parking lot discussion about something that really needs to be handled in the boardroom. So I think that's important as well. This is my contact information. That is my personal cell. Please feel free to write it down. If you have a situation where you just want to process, these are usually five, 10 minute discussions. I'm happy to guide you if you have a particular situation with a particular board member or your um, whole board um, as a whole. And that's my email. So feel free just to email me. Uh, I'm just, I'm here to help. So uh, I just have a heart for nonprofits and the leadership uh, with them. So just know I'm here as a resource as well. And I have, a, I'll launch a quick poll here. Just one question as you walk out the uh -huh. door. Wonderful. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. You're welcome. Stop yes, thank you very much.